Hello, Hello everybody. Hello, Miss Virginia. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you all for joining us today for the Beacon Analysis webcast. If you're new to ACM webcasts, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. We do do a pre-show banter half hour before all our webcasts. So you are a little early, which means that the actual webcast won't begin for another 25 minutes. But in the meantime, you can hang out with us, listen to us talk about some fun things. And you can even share some fun stuff or fun gifts with, uh, gifts with us on our Discord channel. And if you aren't a member of our Discord channel yet, I'm going to share the link to that now in the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. We have a Threat Hunter community Discord channel. We use it for all of our webcasts. So we have a live webcast chat channel. It's the one with the big red button. But it's also just an awesome place to get to know other people in the community talk about threat hunting. We also have some career channels and some LinkedIn connects as well. So feel free to join us and check out that all the channels in our server. We've had a lot of companies that have actually brought out job postings in threat hunting and security type tasks. A number of them are available to people who want to work remotely. So if you're looking for work, this is a great place to go and check out the career hunting channel just a little bit above the live webcast chat. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the pre-show banter. <laughs> yes. Yeah, finding threat hunters has to be hard right now because it's still kind of a new discipline. And it'd be interesting to see how that interview process goes because I think a lot of people that would come in saying, oh, yeah, I've been doing threat hunting for 10 years, and they're not. There's probably an awful lot of that at this point, too. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I forget which webcast it was on, but someone made a comment about seeing a job listing for Threat Hunter where it required five years experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so John Strang can apply for that. Not many other people. <laughs> yeah. Just him. Yeah. Just yeah. him. Yeah. And yourself, Chris. Also. <laughs> yeah, actually, John's been doing this longer than I have. So no, I got to tip my hat to him for that. So wow. I did kind of figure out a long time ago what we're doing is broken, but I just kind of threw my hands up and said, well, F it, it sucks to be us. John was the one who actually kind of figured out how to fix it. So wow. I just kind of helped hone the process since then. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I pretty much thought that both yourself, Chris, and Bill started when servers were powered by coal. We had to like shovel. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, exactly. Yes, and when, you, you, when you typed a key on the keyboard, you'd see the little beads move on the abacus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> floating point <laughs> unit was... <laughs> Let's see. You'll be a few minutes. If you first, if, if you've just connected to our Threat Hunter community Discord for the first time, you'll have a few minutes before you can post. It's there to keep spammers out, and it largely works, largely. Automated bot spammers, yes. Yeah. Would, like yes. join in and just, you know, hey, you know, buy this real estate, you know, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Sell this real estate. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing that it still works, you know, because I mean, they're still doing it because obviously it works. So, yes. you, yeah. the land, you, you know, the buying their crap. <laughs> well, I remember yeah. when we got this started, that was a lot of the concern was that. Because, you know, we used to use just go to webinar and with go to webinar, you couldn't make a comment. You could ask a question. You know, right. us important people could make comments, but, you know, regular audience. Oh, my God, we can't trust them. And. Yeah, Shelby and Bill were actually the ones that were like, hey, so this discord thing, this looks pretty cool. And I remember a lot of people were like, oh, my God, anybody can make a comment. Oh, my God, <laughs> <laughs> this will go horribly wrong. And I, and I have to say, I think since we set this up and it's. Shelby, remind me, how long have we had this server online for now? It's been a little over a year now. Yeah. I can think of one, two issues that have popped up. And yeah. those were kind of handled by folks that were on the server that were not us. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. One was a spammer and one was people, let's say, being a little bit too passionate in their disagreement. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I'm sorry about that. I really will try to do better next time. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. that never yes, happened. Phil, you, Phil no. you're just such an aggressive personality. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, Regressive is the way I like to think of it. But okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. And hey, I know that one of the things we normally get asked during the pre-show, so I figure we'd get ahead of the game on this, is introducing who is, we where's are. Where's the doll? <laughs> Yeah, Where's the, the creepy is, doll? The creepy doll <laughs> is, is always where it belongs. It's in the background where it belongs. If it yeah, gets behind closer, your shoulder where you can't see what it's doing. No, I got my webcam on to make sure that I can <laughs> see what it's doing. Hey, tell me. I think I saw it move a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, wasn't that like a like a Doctor Who episode? Like every time you blinked, it would move a little closer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh shoot! Don't yeah. don't blink. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I no. think there was a similar Monty Python thing that was. I, I, I know what you're talking about. I can't play it. Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Chris, didn't you have a dog that used to do that? Well, we, so we had a dog that I trained not to beg. And what begging meant was don't get caught. <laughs> so, like the, so, like, you'd be eating food and the dog would look at you and you'd look at the dog and it'd look away. And then you look back and the dog would look at you and then you look away and you, know, you did this back and forth with the dog. So he wasn't staring at you when you caught him. So I let that go. So, uh -huh. but yeah, he, he knew what she knew what begging was and she knew not to do it. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> now you just have employees that do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> Well, where I was going to go with that before we trailed off <laughs> was that one of the things we get asked during pre-show a lot, and I figured we'd get ahead of the game this time, for anyone who's new and doesn't know who we are, we should actually introduce ourselves. So sure, I you am... start, Shelby. Sure. I'm prepared <laughs> You're the one who brought time, it up. So. Yeah, I'm okay with starting since I'm actually prepared. But my name is Shelby, and I take care of handling the content community stuff for HCM. So I help make sure all of this gets put together and actually happens. <laughs> and then we have Keith Chu, which if you've ever read our blogs, he's the one who created the Malware of the Day series, which is a super awesome series that I would definitely recommend everyone check out. Then we have Bill Stearns, which Bill, how do I even start explaining what you do? I know. <laughs> as soon as I find out what I'm doing, I'll let you know, and then you can let everybody Bill, else you, know. you got to hold up your shitty little shell scripts card. Oh, business card. Yeah. Yeah. I'll that, that really says business. it in a nutshell. Well, yep. I think really we can definitely sum it up as too much to list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I handle a lot of tech support. I do a couple of blogs. I kind of alternate with Keith from time to time help out with webcasts here and there. It's a, it's a jack of all trades job. <laughs> Whatever's got to be done that day, I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah and yeah. actually talking about the malware of the day, one of the things folks ask is like, you know, how can I hone my skills? You know, if I can't do this on my work network, how do I hone my skills? And there's a couple of things you can do, home lab and all that, but the easiest malware of the day sign up for those blog posts when they come out don't read them just very quickly skip to the bottom and keith will give you a 24-hour pcap of the traffic he generated just pull that down and go through that and see if you can't figure out what's going on and if you think you got the right answer now go read the blog entry you know and keith will double check your work type of thing and he does that at no charge <laughs> and oh, i yeah. do windows yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Both literally and figuratively. So, so, and I'm sorry, Shelby. As usual, I cut you off. So, oh, that's fine. <laughs> well, I was just about to get to you, which is Chris Brenton, who is our lovely presenter for the day, and he's also the COO of Active Countermeasures. And I'm seeing a comment. NC Cyber Threat Hunter says, "Love the shirt, Bill. Seriously considering getting one myself." Yep. So, yes, I love his shirt, too. Like we said, we love our pre-show banter. This is a time where we get to know all of our, you know, attendees. And we have these wonderful T-shirts to go with it. That I'm noticing and Bill got one before I did. I'm not sure what to make of that. I ordered one oh. off the website. There you go. 
fact, they got yes. Yeah. Oh, Which there's actually, the problem. You actually paid for it. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Geez, our customers actually, don't even do that. <laughs> and actually, we have a t-shirt on the Spearfish General Store as well now, too. So if you want to grab the t-shirt Bill's wearing or the new one that we just came out with, check out the Spearfish General Store. I just shared a link into the chat for everybody. I think now I need like a creepy doll shirt. Or something. That's, yeah, that's so we get a, we get a question. Right. Where does one find the malware of the day site? So it's not a site. If you go to acm.re, that's our main website, go to the education link, go to blogs, and it's usually like every other blog. And I'll post a link there, Discord. Oh. Yeah, no free company shirt for you. Yeah, that that's that's true for me. Yep. Oh. Oh. Let's take up a collection so Chris can get a T-shirt from a technical show. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you've yeah, never no, gotten a T-shirt at a conference, have you, Chris? Yeah, <laughs> I, I own no geeky T-shirts. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, none of us have stickers or fridge magnets. Or... Yep. yep. And, Although I did briefly consider wearing my Real Men Hug Cats T-shirt. Oh, I wasn't going to wear that awesome. one. And then said, Meh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with the it's warm and nice shirt. Nice. <laughs> Does it have like claw marks and blood and stuff? Like, <laughs> yeah, really. You <laughs> <laughs> have to put on the requisite band aids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the t shirt's all shredded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I like that shirt right there. Yeah. yeah. That would be from Hugging Cimarron, my favorite kitty. Oh, yeah. And yeah. how large is Cimarron, Chris? Let's see. He's only about 170 pounds. Yes. And so this is a, a good object lesson in not buying too much Purina cat food. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, what well, yeah. I, I know it's hard to, like, get perspective, but if you look at, like, the size of my fist, his paws are bigger than that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But well, he's yeah, a 170, he outweighs me by a lot. <laughs> what type of cat, Chris? He's a Florida panther. There you go. Yep. Wow. Wow. Boy, when the Humane Societies get short on cats and you've only got a few choices left, well, I guess you got to go with what they have. <laughs> got to go with what they have, yeah. You know, whatever's <laughs> left. Hey, what's the name it of the sanctuary? Florida after all. It is Florida after all, you know? That's true. This is, this is the state where... It's actually common to see guys walk into liquor stores with no shirt on, bringing an alligator with them. So. <laughs> because yeah. who knows what would happen in a liquor store if you didn't have your alligator? If you didn't bring your alligator, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's That's not like you can. Well, you know, dude, it's hot down here. You don't want to leave him in the car. It's just going to get too hot. <laughs> so, you know, it's better for the alligator if you bring him into the liquor store with you. So. Oh, that's just so That, that is until Chris shows up with his panther. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chris, what's the name of the sanctuary? Shy Wolf Sanctuary. Yeah. In fact, if you go up to the site and then click on the link for residents, you'll see a picture of Cimarron listed up there. <clears throat> yeah, very cool people doing very cool things. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Nan Nancy and Kent are just awesome. They're the two who run the sanctuary. Just amazing people. You know, that kind of turned into, I think it started with a panther that was going to get put down because they couldn't find a home for it. So they said, okay, we'll take him in. And it just like, I don't know, I'd say they have like 80 animals now out in their backyard. <laughs> wow. wow. Yep. <laughs> well, a 170-pound cat needs a lot to eat. So. Yep. Yep. He likes his bloodsicles. So if you yeah, so if you think about like when you're working with red meat, all that runoff that, you know, we usually just make go away down the sink. Yeah, we'll save that in little plastic cups, freeze it. He loves those, especially when oh, it gets hot. Wow. wow. Yep. <laughs> well, we got a question in the channel. What does pre-show banter mean? Basically yeah. what you're listening to. <laughs> yes. So uh, pre-show banter is what we call this time between the actual start of the presentation and when we launch the webcast so that you guys can actually listen to us. And usually this is exactly what it's like. <laughs>
So yes. It's, yes, it's just a chance for us to get to know you a little better and for you to get to know us outside of just the actual presentation. Although sometimes we just have random conversations. Yeah, well, that's what a lot of it is. I mean, really we, we talk about like cougars and printing statues out of chocolate. <laughs> cougars? Oh, you mean the cats? Yeah, yes. Careful, careful. Ooh, there we go. Print cougars out of chocolate. I like yeah. that one. <laughs> Chris, ready to take it away? Hey, let's do this thing. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, Chris. Cool. And I am going to drop the camera so the screen's a little bigger. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about beacon analysis. As Shelby mentioned, you know, I want to say thanks to our sister companies, Wild West, Black Hills. It really is kind of like a, a triad of silliness between the three of us and what we put on for webcast, which kind of makes it fun. I love doing this talk. We, we, we kind of talk about doing a beacon analysis about once a year. And I love this talk because it's just constantly evolving. You know, when we kind of talk about trying to detect malicious activity on the network, we can usually write a signature to go after it. And beacons is one of those things that we never will be able to write a signature because the whole purpose is to try and blend in and make it look like the rest of the traffic. You really have to do some behavioral analysis, and we'll talk about that, in order to kind of figure out they're there. So it's something that you, you always kind of have to say sharp to be able to identify, which is kind of cool. So where does beacons fit into this whole kind of threat hunting thing? Well, if you're starting on the network, which, oh, by the way, I would highly recommend you start on the network, because you know, starting on the host, you're kind of stuck with what agents you have, which ones you're actually collecting logs from. If we start on the network, hey, equal opportunity, we can protect everything at the same time. You know, not just Windows machines, not just ones we have agents installed on. If one of our industrial Internet of Things gets whacked, we'll detect that. If network gear gets whacked, we'll detect that. So start on the network, you get full visibility. I get the four steps we typically run through to do a, a cyber th threat hunt on the network. Connection persistency, you'll notice, is highlighted in red. This one's kind of the big one to me because one of the first things you all don't want to identify is, is one of my internal systems in constant communications with some host out on the Internet, and I can't identify what the possible business need might be before behind that. We've had customers that have spun up the tool, identified they've got host beaconing out to Kwanzu, China, and sat back and said, hmm, that's interesting. We don't have a field office in Kwanzu, China. We don't have a business partner. We don't have a vendor. We don't have anything. Maybe we should look into that. Yeah, that's a good idea. So connection persistency is where it starts. And there's really two parts to cons consistency. It could be long connections, meaning, hey, just hold open the connection and leave it open all the time. And those are fairly easy to spot. But Beacons is the other one, and these are actually a lot more of a challenge. How much data do you need to collect in order to be able to identify beacons? This is not a light switch. This is kind of a sliding percentage. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you collect 10 minutes worth of data, you'll be able to catch some of the faster beacons that might be going off once per second, some of the older software you can still pull down off of GitHub. You'll certainly be able to go in and detect that. You won't be able to detect something like, like Sunburst that was going off once every 15 minutes, plus or minus a minute and a half, meaning that the delta between the signals were varying as much as you know, 90 seconds either way or off of that 15 minute interval. So if I'm only catching 10 minutes of data, I will never see that. I'll never be able to identify it as beacon. Well, what if I collect a half hour, Chris? Well, then you might get two beacon signals. You're probably, unless you're really, really lucky, you're probably still not gonna be able to tag that. Well, what if I get an hour? Well, you get a little bit more of a chance. You see where I'm going with this? How much data you collect dramatically improves your pro pro probability of being able to detect beacon activity. The more complex it is, the longer the dwell time in between signals, you know, the more data you have, the more likely you are to capture that. Capture that. That's one of the reasons why we really advocate for, hey, you want to keep 20, 24 hours worth of data. And what's the purpose of threat hunting? You know, this is that, hey, my protections have failed. I need to know when to go into response mode. Historically, we have gone through system logs to try and solve this, and that has not worked. In fact, it's gotten worse. I've seen folks posting data saying, hey, we're getting better at dwell time. It used to be six months. It's down to four months. Yay for us. We're getting better at catching the bad guys. And that sounds good until you actually look at the data. 
And what I'm noticing is a trend change is that they're starting to add in ransomware. So think about how ransomware works, right? I drop ransomware on your network, I infect as many systems as possible, and then I tell you you need to pay me money in order to get your network back. Well, wait a minute, I told you I'm there, you didn't detect me, no fair, right? <laughs> that shouldn't get counted. But for most folks, they do count it. So if you know someone gets into your network, they're there for a week, and then they tell you I'm here and I've encrypted all of your drives. Oh, yay, we detected them in a week. We're doing much better than the six month average. No, 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 that's not how this stuff works, right? So you really got to break out ransomware separately from advanced persistent threat. And if you look at advanced persistent threat, we're actually getting a little bit worse than the six month period. Attackers are, are increasing the complexity of their attacks faster than we're increasing our ability to detect those attacks. That makes sense. So what's a beacon? A beacon is a repetitive single. So you've got an internal system, it's become compromised, you've got malware on it. This thing's gonna call out in order to try and get its marching orders. This could be calling out to a specific IP address out on the internet. It could be calling out to a fully qualified domain name. And I'll expand on why that one's actually far more difficult in just a little bit, just a little bit. It's a repetitive signal with some time delta in between the connections. At the end of the day, that's really what a beacon is. So how does this work? Well, that system on the bottom, that's been compromised. So the attacker has been able to circumvent the endpoint software and drop malware on the system. And now that system is calling out to a command and control server out on the internet. And it's gonna do it at, at some predetermined time delta. That might be a fixed time delta, like we're talking about here, do it every 10 minutes. Or it might be a variable time interval. We'll talk more about that one a little bit later and why attackers might do that. But the point is, it's just going to call out on a regular basis and say, hey, do you have anything for me to do? My attacker can then go to its command and go to their command and control server and queue up commands on that server. So they can go in and say, hey, show me, you know, whatever the command is for that particular operating system, show me all running processes. And now the next time the, command, uh, the compromised system checks in with the command and control server, and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? The command and control server says, yes, execute this command, which will get a list of all the running processes. The compromised system will then execute that command. It'll take the output from that command and send it back as part of that same session. So now the attacker can go in and retrieve that information off of the command and control server. So think of it as like a proxy or an intermediary, right? The attacker cannot directly connect to the compromised system because it's sitting on a private network behind a firewall. So it needs that compromised system to call out to a server that they can also talk to in order to be able to relay commands and information back and forth. Now, the method we were just talking about was showing that compromised system connecting directly to the command and control servers. One of the things about that is you get to see, hey, it's connecting to the command and control server. There's ways to kind of obfuscate this traffic. One of the most popular is to just run C2 over DNS. This also solves the problem, hey, if I drop malware on your network, what outbound access is permitted to me? You know, in other words, I go to all the trouble to write malware that'll execute on your endpoint. I don't want to not have control of your network now because I said, hey, connect out on port 2000, and for some random reason, you have port, port 2000 outbound blocked. You know, I don't want to see that happen. So I want to pick something you're likely to let out of your network. Well, everybody uses DNS. So if I can forward traffic that looks like a regular DNS query to the local DNS resolver, like you see here, that server will do what it's designed to do, forward that DNS query out to whatever server is authoritative for that domain. In this case here, the authoritative server for that domain just happens to be the command and control server. So you'll see DNS traffic going out, but hey, we see DNS traffic going out all the time, right? But there's ways to go in and kind of analyze it to figure out, hey, this is actually command and control. The other thing that's kind of interesting to note is if I'm monitoring all my inbound outbound traffic by the firewall here, right? I'm looking to see who's connecting to the internet. The only thing I see is the DNS server talking to that box. I don't actually see the compromise system itself. So let's say I'm here and I actually detect, hey, I got a command and control channel running here. I still don't know which system's compromised. I got to move to the DNS servers and, and maybe turn on query logging and say, hey, which internal host is making all these queries in that remote domain? 
Now I can track it back to the actual compromised host itself. Another technique we're starting to see is the attackers are placing their command and control server behind CDN networks. This is actually pretty scary from a detection standpoint. Because think about this. Well, so what's a CDN network? A CDN network is a content delivery network. The concept is rather than having everybody come to my web server, I'll have them go to this CDN network that may be spread out all over the globe. So now everybody can always talk to a local server that will have cached information related to my website. So it'll be faster, it'll drop some of the load off of my web server itself. You know, there's lots of good reasons why we use CDN networks. These are really popular. Folks like Akamai make an awful lot of money doing this. Well, that same reasoning is kind of why, from an attacker's perspective, it's kind of fun to put your command and control server behind the CDN network, because now this compromised system doesn't talk to the command and control server directly. It talks to the CDN network. That does two things. One is it's going to get load balanced, meaning when I resolve a specific fully qualified domain name, I may end up making requests off of this server here. But when that DNS entry ages out, it might move me over here and then move me over here and then back over here. You know, it'll load balance it through. So now my beacon traffic isn't going from a source IP to a destination IP. My beacon traffic is going from a source IP. In this particular example here, it's going to three different destination IPs. So my beacon won't look fully like a beacon. I have to actually figure out to combine these three sessions together to build the beacon signal. The other complication that gets thrown in here is that legitimate traffic is going to be going through these CDNs. Let's say they do this with Akamai. All the big companies use Akamai. So when you're going to you know, Microsoft or Apple or whoever, you're probably going to an Akamai server to do it. So now that beacon traffic is getting mixed in with the rest of this traffic. Well, geez, how do we even find this, right? We need to be able to map what did the user query for a fully qualified domain name that returned these IPs and look at a beacon from the source IP to the fully qualified, fully qualified domain name address in order to be able to pull everything together properly. So, so for the first two, for this one and for this one, we could look at source IP address to destination IP, and that's actually pretty straightforward. For this one, we need to take all of our external IPs, look at what was the user trying to get to when they got back that IP, and do the mapping to the fully qualified domain name instead. That'll clean out all the legitimate traffic, that'll combine all of these IP addresses together. And it's not an easy technique to go through and do, especially if you're trying to go through and do it manually. Now there's a couple of ways we can go about trying to detect beacons. One is based on timing. So, you know, we talked about this thing, you know, a beacon may call out every 10 minutes. So that's timing-based detection, right? Hey, every 10 minutes, I'm seeing a connection go from this source IP address to that destination IP, I'm detecting based on timing. One of the things that an attacker may do is introduce jitter. We saw that with Sunburst, right? We saw where the quote unquote Russians is what we think you know, was behind the attack was going through and they were beaconing every 15 minutes, plus or minus a minute and a half. Why do that? Why introduce jitter? Why change things up? The answer is most detection tools use an algorithm called K-means clustering. You can look it up on Google, or look it up in look it up in Wiki. <laughs> There's a good description on it. Basically, what K-means is designed to do is it's designed to take very large data sets and identify repeating patterns in them. So imagine you get a million connections going out to the internet, but buried in there, you you have one internal IP that calls out to an external IP once every minute exactly on the 60 second mark. Well, that's a repeating pattern. So K-means will detect that no problem. But as soon as I introduce just a little bit of jitter, like 10%, K-means looks at that and says, well, that's not a repetitive pattern anymore, and it starts ignoring it. So if your beacon detection tool is relying on K-means to detect beacons, it'll detect the beacons the attackers were doing a year or two ago, and it'll generate a lot of false positives on things. It's not going to actually detect any actual attacks because pretty much everybody's using Pretty much all red teamers and attackers are using Cobalt Strike these days to go in and jitter their connections. Now, how do we kind of identify those beacons? How do we find those time deltas? One is to throw them into time buckets. So I can go in and I can say, all right, I want to look at 
when my internal IP is connected to an external IP, and I want to break them out into one hour blocks. That's actually what this graph does here. So each one of these bars is a one hour period of time. My Y axis is quantity. So it's identifying is how many times did the source connect to the destination in, during that one hour period of time. And you'll notice when I graph it this way, I end up with a flat line across the top. That's an indicator, indicator of a beacon. And in fact, this is actually a good way to even find things with jitter. So imagine beaconing once per minute, plus or minus 50%. Well, that means my delta time might be as short as 30 seconds, might be as long as 90 seconds. So it's not an exact interval. K means it's gonna look at that and say, yeah, that's not something I have to pay attention to. So how do we detect it? Well, even the, so the timing's varying. Just because random isn't as random as it you might think, we're gonna pick time intervals closer to the middle, closer to the 60 second mark, more often than we're gonna pick the extremes, you know, the 30 second mark or the 90 second mark. And even when we do, we're probably going to get about an equal quantity of each, which means they're going to kind of normalize each other out. So if I go through and, you know, if I'm trying to look at it from a signal to signal standpoint, it's going to vary all over the place. But if I go in and start putting it in one hour or two hour buckets, well, I'm still going to see a, even, you know, so 60 second beacon plus or minus 50%, I'm still going to see that go off about 60 times every hour. I'm still going to see it go off about 120 times every two hours. And the randomization actually ends up kind of normalizing itself out. And I still end up with, you guessed it, a flat line across the top of the whole thing. So this is one of the ways we can go about trying to grab something like that. This is just another way to go in and look at that same data. So what we're graphing here is, hey, how often did a specific time interval, in this case here, one second appear, and how many of those beacon signals used that time interval? So anytime you see a solid line like this, anytime you can go in and look at the time deltas and all the time deltas are the same like we're seeing here, this is a beacon. Now, this is also a potential false positive. What do I mean by that? I mean that some things, you know, like NTP, like Windows Message Bus on a Windows system, use beaconing to communicate, but they beacon on an exact interval. You know, NTP will go off anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes, depending upon what your operating system, but it will always be at exactly the same time interval. Like it will always go off exactly at the 20 minute mark. So when I see something like this, I look at it and I say, okay, this might be something I need to worry about, but it might also be a false positive because it's a beacon that's not trying to hide the fact that it's a beacon. When you see something like this, this is a beacon trying to hide the fact that it's a beacon. So notice what's happening here. My source is connecting to my destination at different time intervals between the connections. Some of them are as slow as five seconds. Some of them are as long as this to be about 46 seconds. And you know, notice there's a lot, this, I pulled this example out because there's actually some really good randomization in here, right? <laughs> you know, because when you use cobalt strike to go in and jitter timing, you end up with something that kind of looks like a bell curve. Because like I said, you're gonna grab the, the middle more often than the end, so you end up with kind of a bell curve here. This is not a bell curve. This is an attacker actually put time and effort into varying their timing signal on a beacon, which is very rare to say, and they did a pretty decent job with it. But again, start normalizing this stuff out, we're still gonna be able to detect it as a beacon. We can also do detection based on session size. So sleep random, yep. <laughs> That's what, well, typically it's sleep random within a range, right? So it's you know sleep ra sleep random fifty percent. So that'll say okay, grab something plus or minus fifty percent uh, up to from zero to fifty percent. But like I said, we're going to grab those extremes far less frequently than something a little bit closer to the middle. That's why we end up with something that looks like a bell curve. So we can also try and do detection based on session size. And quite honestly, if you want to try and detect attacks or detect beacons that are using social media. This is the only way you can actually go through and do that. So for example, let's say we're suspicious that you know GCAT may be running on the network. GCAT uses Gmail as its communication channel. I can't use timing because if I'm running, let's say I got my web browser open for my email, my web browser is gonna go check to see if I have new mail about every 10 to 12 seconds. Well, Gmail, GCAT goes off every 10 to 12 seconds as well. So it uses the same timing interval as a regular user would, which means I can't use timing to figure out it's a beacon. I have to fall back on something like session size. 
One of the cool things about session size is not only can it help us detect beacons, it can help us figure out if the beacon's been activated. Notice one signal here is identified as heartbeat. What's this? This is the system calling a home saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And the command and control server is saying, nope, go back to sleep. And it waits its delta time and then calls back in again and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And says, no, go back to sleep. So that command sequence of, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. That's going to use up a certain amount of data as part of that session. That's going to be my heartbeat. So when I check in and find out there's nothing for me to do, that's typically what happens most frequently as part of a command and control session. Anytime I get a different data size like you see here, that's an indication that something different happened across that channel. In other words, when the system called in and said, do you have anything for me to do? The answer was yes. And whatever it was told to do resulted in this different amount of data getting transferred instead. Now, it's probably been a good two, maybe three years since I've seen attackers using clear text channels. Everybody encrypts things today. In fact, most of them will encrypt it and then wrap a TLS session around it and encrypt it again. So it's that much harder to figure out what's going on. So if we had PCAP files, let's say we had a full PCAP capture of this session, we probably still wouldn't be able to see what the commands were that were being passed back and forth. But you can make some pretty good guesstimates based on session size. For example, this top one here is probably like 300 bytes or less. That's not a lot of data. That might be enough to look at some files, maybe a couple processes in memory, that's about it. Now imagine on this system is our customer database and our customer database is 20 gigs in size. And we figure out that, hey, if you compress it down, it ends up being about five gigs. And then I look and do this type of an analysis and I see one of my session sizes is 20 gigs in size. What do you think happened? Our database got stolen, right? That 20 gig session is probably due to the 20 gig database that was sitting on that system. The attacker probably went in and just grabbed that. So if we're asked, did the attackers get to our private customer information? In this case here, we can pretty solidly say no. They didn't, they weren't able to remove all of our customer data. If there's a spike here out at 20 gigs, you know, or there's just one data point here out at 20 gigs, our answer to that is probably, yeah, they probably did get a copy of a customer database at that point. And you can look at similar using something like Zeek. So with Zeek, I can go in and I can say, hey, I like to look at original bytes. Original bytes is how much data did the source send to the destination? And what I'm doing here is I'm going through the con.log file. I'm piping it through BroCut or ZCut, depending upon whatever version you're running. I'm pulling out the source IP address, the destination IP address, and how many bytes were transferred. I'm looking, for, looking at one particular IP address that appeared to me like, hey, this might be a potential beacon. Let me go in and do an analysis on this. And then I'm going through and I'm sorting it. So what the sort, this first sort command is going to do is anytime the source IP and the destination IP address match, it's going to line those up one after the other inside of the output. Then I'm saying unique dash C. Unique dash C goes in and says, hey, anytime the source, the destination, and the session size is the same, compact that down to a single line and increment a counter to tell me how many lines you remove. Then I'm saying sort dash RN. So sort dash RN says, I want to sort again but based on this first column, which is now how many times was this specific session size seen. R says do it as a reverse sort, so big numbers before small numbers. N means this is a numeric value, not alphanumeric, so treat it as a real number and sort it accordingly. And then pump it through head just says, show me 10 lines of output. Now, in this case here, we only had two. But notice what we've got. We're seeing that every single session size is exactly the same, 546 bytes in size. There's one outlier here, this one here. And this has a dash. What does that mean? A dash means that there was no data exchanged. So most likely what happened here, now we don't know if this is TCP, UDP, whatever the case may be. You know, usually it's TCP, I'll guess TCP on this one, but it could be UDP and this works the same. What happens if the command and control server is busy and starts rejecting connections? So in other words, we send a TCP SYN packet to it to create a session and it kicks back a reset packet. It says, nope, sorry, not right now, I'm too busy. That's gonna result in no data getting transferred, right? 
So I think at one point during this session, it tried to do a, you know, a connect and was told, go away, come back later. And that's why we've got the zero file length or the zero data size. Everything else is that 546 bytes. So this tells me, okay, if this does turn out to be a malicious beacon, they haven't actually activated yet. They haven't actually done anything with this yet. So if I can kick them off now, I know they haven't touched my system. They haven't tainted anything yet beyond the malware that was already on the system that they got in via phishing attack or whatever the case may happen to be. So potential false positives. So false positives will not show signs of jitter. I mentioned that. So if I'm seeing an exact time interval, that's going to be my most likely candidate for maybe it's a false positive and I don't have to worry about it. If I'm looking at a signal that's getting jittered, yeah, that's something I need to go in and pay attention to. That, that's something that means I'm going to have a really bad day. Some common false positives, you know, you can read the list. But it's usually, these are things that are repetitive, meaning like the first time you'll go through and do this threat hunt, you'll see, you know, maybe a bunch of NTP servers that all your systems are syncing to. And you can look at it and see, oh, yeah, that's actually legit NTP traffic. You can go in and you can create an exception list that says, okay, ignore any beacons you see going to these known NTP servers. And now when you do your next threat hunt, all that data will get pushed out of the way so that you don't have to pay attention to that. But the Windows stuff, the remote desktop stuff, it's all the same. And remember, some of this does come down to business need. So remote desktop tools, right? So TeamViewer, <laughs> there's a good one, right? Is TeamViewer evil? Well, that depends upon whether we know it's there and there's a business need behind it, right? If I go in and I put TeamViewer on my server to be able to remotely manage it, well, I know it's there. It's in there for a business need. It's okay. But if I search my network and I find five other system servers have TeamViewer on it, and I didn't expect them to be running TeamViewer, that's a problem. So it's not necessarily about the connectivity. That would just make this too easy. It's actually about the business need. So when we find this type of communications, we can say, okay, there's persistency here. That's something worth paying attention to. But the real question is, is there a business need behind it? Because if there is, we're okay. We can create an exception for it. If not, yeah, we, we're going to have a bad day, probably a bad week, maybe worst case, a bad month type of thing. Mischaracterizations, you know, long connections with pauses longer than the time out of your monitoring tool. What do I mean by that? You'll see this with connections back to the Microsoft environment a lot. There are some things that Windows does where it's actually holding open a long connection. So it'll connect back to a Microsoft server and it'll keep that connection open all the time but it doesn't transmit data across that session constantly. Sometimes it'll pause for like a half hour or more. Well, if I'm using a tool like Zeek, Zeek has timeouts built into it. You know, we do this with our firewalls, right? Our firewalls are kind of usually designed that, hey, if I permit a traffic pattern through, but I don't see any data flow for an hour, I'm going to assume that session died and I'm just going to remove it from my state table. Well, Zeek does something similar to that. Zeek goes in and says, okay, I'm going to keep track of this long connection, but if I don't see any data for five minutes, I'm going to assume that long connection has been terminated, and I'm just going to go through and remove it from my state table and write out the log entry. Well, like I said, that session is still active, but it just doesn't send data for a half hour or more. So what you end up seeing in the Zeek data is something that looks like a beacon going off every half hour. But if you go in and check the TCP flags, check the source port, the destination port, and all of that, you'll see, no, 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 this is actually one session. Zeek is just capturing different portions of it as it goes through. So that's one that could end up looking like a, day, a beacon if you're going in and doing your analysis, when in fact it's a long connection. How do you fix this? Change Zeek's timeout to an hour. You know, that seems to take care of the problem. So let's kind of look at an example of some of this. So I've got a copy of AA Hunter here. Don't get too concerned about that. But what I wanted to do is kind of walk you through some of this stuff. So we talked about analyzing beacon timing, right? Here's that, this is straight from that slide that we were talking about, because what I wanted to show you is a couple things here. We've got this, the timing delta is being changed, right? We're seeing as low as five seconds. So there were four connections that took place at a five second interval. We have one connection at a 46 second interval, and then we have a bunch of connections in between. You can see most of it's kind of clustered in this area here, 
So the and but look at this chart on the bottom. Remember I said anytime I can draw a flat line here, that's a beacon. And you can see it's not exactly flat, but it's pretty close to it. This is one to be concerned about. In other words, when I see this, when I see something that looks like this, this tells me it's a beacon and it's probably evil. Because again, legitimate traffic that uses beacon communications do not attempt to hide themselves, right? They don't introduce jitter. They just go off at a regular interval and call it a day. The fact that this is jittering, yeah, that makes it something that's worth paying attention to. The other one that's kind of interesting about this one is, so here's my heartbeat. Right? This is my, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Notice I've got 300 connections with 40 bytes in them. wonder what that's about. Because that, that's kind of odd, right? That's almost implying some command went through that takes up less data than calling in and saying, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Well, remember your TCP, and, or remember your IP header sizes. My minimum size for an IP header is 20 bytes. My minimum size for a TCP header is 20 bytes. 20 plus 20 equals 40. Ergo, this was a situation where we had, you know, that connection attempted to take place and it was probably rejected. So there was actually, so what this says to me is there's 300 instances of this thing trying to call in and the command and control server was just too busy or the service had shut down or something along those lines had occurred. So we can safely ignore that. But notice we've got additional data points out here. Here's one that's around a K. That's my biggest. I've got three out here that's about a, about a K and a half, somewhere in that range there. So we're still seeing small amounts of data going back and forth. Now, this could be compressed, right? The beacon may have compression built into it, in which case maybe it's about double that size. You know, if we kind of ballpark it that way. That's telling me that, all right, maybe we transferred about four or 5K. All right, I might be able to grab like image files, text files with that much information, look at processes and memory directory lists. This certainly isn't like Word documents or PDFs or spreadsheets or anything like that. It's too small of a size for that. You know, so again, I can go in and kind of run this down. And I rem remember I said part of this, let me find a legitimate one here real quick. Oh, come on, we got to have some legitimate traffic in here somewhere, unless I get it all whitelisted out. Here we go. Here we go. So here's one. Hey, this kind of looks like a beacon, right? It looks like the system gets shut off sometimes. But hey, we've got a flat line almost entirely across this thing, except for you know two specific data points. So this is kind of looking like a beacon, but it's looking very repetitive, right? It doesn't look like it's trying to hide itself. And, you know, and we said those are potential false positives. Notice what we've got up here. Here's the fully qualified domain name the user was trying to get to when they ended up going to that IP address. Tileservice.weather.microsoft.com. What do you think that is? It's a Windows 10 widget, right? That shows the weather. Think about, think about how widgets work, right? Something like the weather. You don't want to know what the weather was when you booted your system up and then it never changes after that. You want updates, right? You know, you, you want to know, well, yeah, I booted my system five days ago and I know it was sunny five days ago, but I want to know what the weather is today. So that weather tile is calling out every 30 minutes. In this case here, it didn't call out. So that to me says something got shut down, maybe the whole laptop, maybe the service. Here it connected in once, but it's connecting in on average twice, you know, every 30 minutes to find out, hey, what's the current weather? Come back and show me. And it's going out to Microsoft. Now, if I'm not sure if that's really Microsoft, I can go in and I can start doing some investigation work, maybe take that information and go up to VirusTotal and say, okay, what is known about that host? One of the things I like to do is check history. Because if it's something like Microsoft.com, it has been Microsoft.com forever. Right. It won't be it won't jump around between five or six different domain names you've never heard of before. It's usually going to be Microsoft the whole time. And one of the things I can do at VirusTotal is I can go through and look at, you know, what was the history on this thing? And this says, yeah, OK, this is solidly Microsoft. So I talk. So cool. So that tells me, yeah, OK, this is a false positive. So now I know anything talking to this IP address 
that's going to be a false positive, right? If all any of my other systems are checking in here, that's just their little widgets checking in to find out what the weather is too. So one of the things I may want to do is go in and create an exception. So I can go in and I can create an exception that says, hey, if you see this traffic in the future, don't pay attention to that. And now when I do my future hunts, that won't show up again, which is kind of cool. Now, let's see, what else do I want to show you here? Oh, actually, let me load up another data set quick. This one here. So that's all based on IP. Remember we said you could also do it based on fully qualified domain name. Now in this case here, this domain name just maps to a single IP address, but if it, it could map to multiple. Like I said, we could, what if this was sitting behind a CDN network? Well, now I may see three or four different IPs all associated with that host name. So when I go in and I kind of build my tables to figure out, is this a beacon or not? I can't do it from source IP to destination IP. I've got to do it from source IP to every IP address that resolved to that host name for that endpoint, which means having access to DNS information is absolutely critical as part of this. You know, a lot of folks are kind of wondering, hey, DNS over TLS, good idea, bad idea. Oh, it's a freaking horrible idea because you, you lose visibility of stuff like this as soon as you start letting your users do that. Not, not, not a good idea. I know we're being told, yeah, it's a privacy thing. And, you know, maybe in some cases it is. To me, really what it's about is it's a bunch of browser companies saying, hey, ISPs are making a lot of money from, you know, trolling all your DNS queries. How do we get into that? How do we get some of that action? Oh, I know. Let's just tunnel it all back to us. You know, on your corporate network, you want to see the DNS queries so you can run stuff like this down. So that is that in a nutshell. So, hey, so you, if you are a common viewer, you probably noticed that I just kind of gave you a quick run through our tool, AC Hunter. And, you know, that's not something we usually do. Usually we wait till the very end and maybe do a quick little demo and tell you to type demo in chat on GoToMeeting. If you want an actual demo, but hey, I just kind of like sat down and kind of played with the tool. Why? There's a reason for that. We are launching a CTF, Capture the Flag. So this is a, think of this as like a little online quiz or an online challenge. So here is the link you want to go to. And let me throw that into the Discord channel as well. So you have something that's just easily clickable. Oh, except Shelby beat me to it. Ah, oh, she always does. Thanks, Shelby. So what's the challenge? So go to that link. When you go to that link, that's going to give you all the rules, all the steps and everything that are regarding that regards this challenge. There's a couple of things you need to do. Read the page, read the instructions, then go to the first link that gets listed, which is for the actual CTF question environment. And when you click on that, you'll have to go in and create a login. You know, we're not going to harvest you, honest we're not but create a login and that'll give you access to the test questions. Also, you will be given a URL to log into along with a login name and password to access, you guessed it, an AC Hunter server and the, use the AC Hunter server to go through and try and answer all those questions. There's a method to our madness. What we tried to do, actually, when I say we, I mean, Keith did it and I'm just trying to steal some of the credit from him. So Keith went through and basically set this up like a real threat hunt. So if you're going in and analyzing data, what would you look for in what order? To kind of let you know if this is something bad or not. So there's a bunch of questions up there. Go through, answer them. There is online help. Whoever gets it done the quick, quickest with the least need for help and gets the least number wrong, there's going to be prizes. The top prize is one of my favorite things, which is a Tesla coil you can play music through. Because, oh my God, what's better than like listening to music that's getting vibrated through electricity, right? I will say, do not put it near your <laughs> mechanical-based hard drive. Probably a bad idea. Hey, come on, it's Tesla coil. Uh, but there's some cool prizes, some bragging rights for this whole thing. It starts today. Today is the 5th, Cinco de Mayo, yay. We're only going to give you a couple of days to go through and get this done. We think people can really just kind of run through and hit this. So the contest starts today. So go ahead, grab this link. It's in the chat channel. Get started. And you can go through and you can hit that. So like I said, you're going to hit that page. It'll give you all the information. You'll log into the question site. Now, you'll notice the questions are kind of laid out like this. DB1, DB2, there'll be a DB3 down the bottom. 
All of these questions are associated with a specific database on the AC Hunter server that you're going to be using. So if I want to answer questions in DB1, when I am on the main page, I'm going to click the little gear icon and I'm going to select database one. Then I'll go through and answer all of these questions. Once I'm done, I'll click the little gear icon, go to DB2, and now I can answer DB2 questions. You know, lather, rinse, repeat for DB3. So pretty straightforward to figure out what database you should be in as part of going through and doing this. Once you're done, if you kind of want to play around with some malicious traffic and what it might look like, you know, I was talking about GCAT today, VS Agent, Empire, those were two really popular HTTP-based command and control channels. You can go in and kind of play around with what those things actually look like too. So we gave you a couple extra data sets to be able to work with up there. And if you got any questions on this, go ahead and throw it in the Discord channel. Normally, I put my email address up here and I say, hey, if you got questions, feel free to drop me an email. I don't want to do this this time because any questions that revolve around doing the CTF, I think it's only fair they get answered for everybody, not just the person that got answered. So questions will only be answered within this Discord channel. That way, if you ask a question, you're not the only one who's going to get privy to the answer. Everybody else will be able to see it as well. So keep an eye on this Discord channel. We'll keep it running until the 8th. This is where you can come back to and get some additional information. And that be all I got. So I wanted to end this a little bit early today, just because I know most people are going to block themselves out about an hour for the actual talk. If we end early, that gives you back like 10 minutes of your life to be able to jump in and do the CTF. So Shelby, Bill, Keith, you guys got anything else you want to toss in before we are done? Yes. I'm going to share the Discord link one more time for everybody in GoToWebinar, just in case you haven't had a chance to join our Discord server yet. In case anybody missed the link to the CTF, I did pin it up in Discord too. And if you don't know what that means, if you look at the top of your screen where it lists the name of the channel you're in, you'll see a little kind of pin icon yeah. <laughs> between a bell the and- pin is where you find pinned information. Funny how that works. <laughs> And you can find the link right at the top of that information. Somebody's asking, just want to confirm where the questions for the CTF would be. So we linked you to a page that has all the information to get set up with the CTF. And there's going to yep. be two different spaces. There's a ctf.d hosted site. And that's where all the questions are. And then we also linked you to an AC Hunter instance that you can use for the CTF as well. And as always, part of the CTF is identifying whether you can follow the instructions. <laughs> that is a big part of it too. And I, you know, I, I gave some kudos to Keith for working on the questions. I also want to shout that out to Hannah as well. She put a lot of good work into this too. So that's awesome. Bill didn't do anything. Bill didn't do anything. So F you, Bill. <laughs> you too, Chris. You had to do it. Yeah, that's right. I didn't do anything either. So F me. So F me and F Bill, thank you, Keith, thank you, Hannah. And Shelby, I know you like busted your backside to make this happen, so thank you very much. Yes. Oh, of course, yeah. anytime. Well, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. I think Chris, along with the rest of us maybe, are gonna hang out in the Discord for a little while to answer any questions around the CTF. Absolutely. That, if you love this webcast and wanna attend another one, we do one about once a month and we also have a four, actually it's six hour now, threat hunt training that we do for free. And if you're interested in any of those, you can check out our events page on our website and that has the list of all our upcoming webcasts and trainings. And I'm seeing the questions, so I'm just gonna mention this real quick too. The slide deck from today can be found in the GoToWebinar handouts and also the ACM webcast content channel. And with that, I hope everyone has fun with the CTF and we'll see you in the next webcast. Thank you folks, appreciate you coming in.